All right, uh, so we're in week three today. Um, this is a week where we shift attention from memoirs written by the victims to looking at and trying to understand the perpetrators. So it's a, a week that we're gonna spend uh, first trying to understand a little bit about the background of who the people were that primarily on the upper echelons who committed the crimes that uh, you've already read about in Samantha Power's book, you've read about in Primo Levi and Ali Wiesel, and try to understand a little bit about the, both the mindset as well as the rationales and the basis uh, for the implementation of the Nazi racial policies and uh, genocidal uh, anti-Semitism. So that's the basis of, of this week. Um, on Thursday, uh, and this will kind of bridge today as well, we'll look at one, or really two particular cases. Um, the case of Adolf Eichmann and um, the case of a man who's significantly less well known, uh, Karl Hawker, um, who was an SS officer uh, stationed at Auschwitz. Uh, what's interesting about Thursday, just uh, so you can get a sense of where we're going, is that we'll try to move from more broad generalizations about the perpetrators and trying to understand the broad um, plans that were put in place based on the conference protocols from the Wannsee Conference, as well as reports from the so-called Einsatzgruppen, the mobile uh, killing units, and we'll turn to very particular profiles of two uh, Nazi perpetrators. And we'll do so by looking at Eichmann, uh, mainly from the lens of a philosopher by the name of Hannah Arendt, who reported on his trial, and also a photograph book, a really extraordinary photo book, um, that's recently come into the hands of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum that was created by Karl Hawker. It basically documents his time in Auschwitz and is really a very kind of personal and in many ways a kind of like a keepsake, you might say, of the time of what, how he spent his time in Auschwitz and particularly how he spent his free time. Uh, so it will give us some insight, I think, um, into the everyday life of Nazis moving away from maybe gross generalizations about their uh, sadism or kind of... Uh, sadistical impulses and more towards the somewhat everyday, individualized, even the human uh, features of uh, the human decisions that went into the very policies and, uh, and the violence that uh, they perpetrated. So that's, that's where we are this week. Um, just as a looking forward, by the way, uh, week four primarily deals with poetry. Uh, week five on acts of resistance. So. I'm going to we'll spend the second part of the class today talking about the film. Hopefully you had a chance to look at it. Uh, it's all on YouTube. And um, this is, unfortunately, most of the films that we'll watch for the class, at least the other three, are not available uh, in their full uh, form on YouTube. But the film Conspiracy is. Um, it's not the film that I usually show in the class, but it's, uh, it's a similar film uh, that's uh, a reenactment of the conference that took place in Bonsai outside of Berlin in 1942. So good. Well, I'm going to shift attention to um, a couple things now. Just a little bit of background about um, the perpetrators themselves. And I'll go ahead and we'll, might as well view this on slideshow version. Um, we finished talking last time about Primo Levi and Elie Wiesel, um, at least as much as I could in class. Hopefully, you had a chance in discussion section to go over uh, those two memoirs in more detail and to focus on particular passages um, where Wiesel and Levy are discussing not just uh, their compatriots uh, who are in camps with them, but also the representations and perceptions they had of those in charge. And that's sort of our starting point today, is looking at some of the top Nazi command and getting a sense about some of the policies that were put in place, particularly leading up to the Wannsee Conference and then following from. And uh, this, uh, then we'll look at the, the film in the second half of the day. Um, people often ask me about this class why we spend so little time talking about Hitler. And uh, it seems to me that uh, there's lots of reasons why one should um, make Hitler the kind of front and center of a class on the Holocaust. And certainly, given uh, the extraordinary 
a range of anti-Semitic writings, speeches, uh, policies that he was responsible for, that he enacted, uh, all the way uh, at the end of the First World War, throughout the 1920s, and obviously further throughout the 30s and, and early 40s, Hitler would be the obvious centerpiece of a class like this. Now, I agree with that. Uh, that is true. Uh, there's no question that his policies and writings and speeches were absolutely critical. And there's no question that the German people uh, during the Nazi period identified greatly with uh, what they called their Führer, their leader. Um, and there's no question that many of the concepts, like the mantra of Ein Reich, Ein Volk, Ein Führer, the kind of unity that that meant to breed, uh, one empire, one people, one leader, or the idea of expanding the German living space, the Lebensraum, a policy that was very important at the start of the Second World War, or even his very clearly articulated policy to annihilate the Jewish race, as he called it, the Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse uh, Europas, as he articulated it in 1939 at a very large rally. Now, all that would speak the fact that we should spend more time talking about Hitler, but in fact, um, one of the arguments that I want to make and one of the things I think is so central for understanding what happened is the fact that this was an amazingly horizontal uh, group of people that in order for a genocide, this scope to take place, needed the buy-in of a tremendous number of different people, units, um, the military, the economy, financial support, military support, uh, industry, um, social support, different ministries, justice, uh, law, and truly the man and woman power, um, in the case of the SS in 1942, numbering at 900,000 active participants, an extraordinary number for an elite trained group. And the SS were largely responsible for the concentration camps and the death camps, the administration of the genocide. All that's to say is that certainly one person may have had that vision, or perhaps a group of people, and we can name them as Hitler, Goring, Himmler, uh, Heydrich, and others in the top Nazi chain of command. But in order for it to be carried out, right, in order for the actual execution of the policy, you needed the buy-in of a tremendous number of people. You needed the buy-in of a large part of the German population. Um, you need a large part of whether they're bystanders or collaborators in terms of turning people in, um, also of active participation of police forces, but also the complicity of various groups that were also um, taken over as the Le Lebensraum of the Nazis expanded. Um, Hitler may have set policy, certainly set tone, certainly was a kind of uh, godlike figure in the eyes of many Germans in the 1930s, and most famously you know, glorified in the films that Leni Riefenstahl um, made of Hitler uh, during various rallies and other things. But what's important for our sakes is that we almost need to turn our attention to everyday Nazis. That is to say, folks, people who were more of the middle rank, uh, or perhaps middle and upper rank, who actually carried out the plans. So Hitler may have been in many ways um, a rabid visionary in terms of his anti-Semitism, but in terms of the actual day-to-day -day carrying out, it was left to people who were underneath of him. Um, underneath of him, you find uh, Hermann Göring, uh, who was Hitler's successor. He was uh, the one who articulated to Heydrich in uh, a number of letters to find a complete solution, a Gesamtlösung, to the Jewish question. Um, this is an important term. It goes back to our first terms that we talked about early on, about what terms the Nazis used to describe what they were doing. And you might remember those terms, just uh, briefly to remind you. Um, these, Vernichtung, the one used by Hitler, Ausrottung, widely used by Himmler in his writings, uh, Inlosung, or in this case, Gesamtlosung, uh, and later the term Volkermord. Uh, so final solution, complete solution, these are kind of euphemistic terms uh, that are used. Ausrottung, widely used by Himmler, but Vernichtung, uh, although articulated by Hitler, was not always the term that was used uh, in day-to-day -day activities. Often more euphemistic terms like evacuation uh, from the Vance conference protocols was used, and partially in order to, um, to hide the reality of what was, what was happening. Um, Underneath, uh, also underneath of Hitler, you have uh, Himmler, 
who was the chief of S the SS, the head of the Gestapo. Um, and also uh, underneath you have uh, Reinhard uh, Heydrich. Heydrich is the one who convened the Wannsee Conference. And uh, although his name, for those of you who haven't studied the Holocaust before, may be unfamiliar, he was absolutely critical in instrumentalizing almost every aspect of what we understand to be the Holocaust. And this is all the more extraordinary because he was killed um, in the summer of 1942 uh, by Czech uh, resistors. And so it was, he was killed prior to the fact uh, that, the, that is to say, the genocide went on for almost two and a half more years uh, um, after he was killed. So at the time um, when the conference was called, he was the head of something called the Einsatzgruppen. Uh, these I'll talk a little bit more about today. These were the first uh, kind of, this is the first way in which genocide was carried out in territories that the Nazis conquered. Uh, they didn't first introduce gas chambers. They didn't first have uh, mobile gas vans. They basically had machine guns. And uh, these machine guns, these mobile command killing units went systematically from town to town, uh, primarily in very small uh, Eastern European villages and towns many of which were completely, uh, or the vast majority were Jews, or completely uh, towns full of Jews. And uh, they systematically killed the populations, often driving them into the forests, or, or having them dig own, their own mass graves, being shot in mass and buried. Um, we have footage of this, actually historical footage, uh, amazingly, that's on the website from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. There's very little video footage of this that was actually taken and saved, but there is an example from 1941 of an Einsatzkommando group marching um, men, women, and children in front of a huge pit and basically, um, astoundingly, um, mowing them down with bullets. Uh, it's very, it's, you look at it, you watch this, and I gave you the link on the, on the website, you almost, you think that you must be seeing a movie. You think you must be seeing something that's Hollywood or make-believe, but this is real historical footage, and it's one of the only examples of this action that exists today. Um, what's significant about this is that by the time the Vance Conference took place in January 20th, 1942, these Einsatzgruppen had already killed more than a million people through these techniques, uh, through the techniques of going systematically from town to town and, um, and murdering uh, the population. Each uh, Einsatzgrupp, as I mentioned down there, there were four, uh, simply called A, B, C, and D, occupy, uh, primarily worked in areas um, around the Ukraine, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, mainly in small groups of men, small meaning 600 to 1,000 men. They're specially trained commandos, and uh, these went from town to town in a more systematic way um, in the middle of the summer of 1941, although we know of, uh, prior to that, other examples that were somewhat more unsystematic uh, before 1941. Um, the other thing that Heydrich is known for, and this is also significant, is the authorization to begin uh, carbon monoxide gassings um, in three of the death camps, Kelmnell, Beltset, and Treblinka, um, in late 1941, between October and December of 1941, also before the Vance Conference actually took place. Um, you might remember I had mentioned this before, is that originally this was not Zyklon B uh, in showers, but in fact were specially uh, created um, trucks in which carbon monoxide gas was pumped in through the bottom and inside the trucks uh, somewhere between 60 and 100 uh, people would be placed and essentially asph asphyxiated. And this process uh, was tried, and it was very much a kind of trial and error process uh, that was going on. But this process was perfected in some ways um, in, the, in the winter of 1941 under the direction of, of Heydrich. Um, what's interesting as well is that one of the companies um, you'll see in uh, Lanzmann's film Shoah, this is just a, something to think about in the future, um, when I talk about the complicity of different parts of um, the fact that not a single person could have done this, right? That uh, there was complicity between industry and the killing units that were established at concentration and death camps. We already saw uh, IG Far Farben, uh, the, the chemical company, had opened a major slave labor camp in Auschwitz. Um, and that camp employed all those people who were selected for work 
uh, when they came to Auschwitz-Birkenau. So you have the complicity between German industry and uh, German genocidal racial policy. Um, the same thing existed for the carbon monoxide vans. Uh, they were manufactured, um, the company was originally Swiss, called Zauer, and they had a German, um, a German unit, and they were hired to create these special carbon monoxide vans uh, for killing people. And so it's extraordinary that this could be outsourced to an existing German company that was prior to this involved with moving and uh, transportation. Uh, so they, they made trucks, they made buses and other things. And then they engineered these very special vans to, uh, to exterminate people as well. And so this just goes to show, again, that the broad range of complicity that was necessary in order to carry out something this truly, um, this truly grand. Okay, um, yeah, we'll come back to that. So let me, uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about some of the things that happened prior to the Vance conference, particularly, um, I have a number of links that I want to show you, um, particularly starting with the Einsatzgruppen, because this is, um, again, kind of this might be seen as the prelude, although this was a genocide already by this time in 1940, 1941. Um, What's extraordinary is how systematic it happened and the fact that you had this, um, you had policies and procedures already in place prior to their codification in Vansay. And so one of the most compelling, I think, and uh, this is concerns um, the Jewish population in uh, Latvia, uh, so we're over here, we're in Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, the reports were that in the areas, um, primarily in the Ukraine and then in more north uh, involving these countries, you had a systematic moving of these mobile command uh, units uh, moving through these countries, moving town by town and shtetl by shtetl uh, to annihilate uh, the populations, primarily the Jewish population, but also a number of gypsies uh, who were also found there, as well as a number of communist resistors and other political dissidents. Um, this is 1939, and so this is, happens starting around 1941, 1942. And one of the reports that we have, and this is the one that I want to talk to you about, is by um, a man named, uh, by, by the last name of Jaeger, uh, who was in charge of one of the Einsatz Commando groups. In this case, it's Einsatz Commando Group Number 3. And his report is basically of the work that this particular mobile commando unit did um, in Lithuania in the winter of 1941. Um, what's interesting about this report, a couple of things, there's an English translation here, which I'm going to talk to you a tiny bit about now. But there's also the original German, uh, which is the actual report that was, um, sorry about that, the actual report that was provided about the work that this particular commando unit did. Now, of course, this requires you to read German in order to understand it, but you can already begin to get a sense as to what this is about. The very first thing at the top there, it's, it's stamped, you know, secret uh, matter concerning the, the Reich, the Nazi, uh, the Nazi Reich. Um, so this was a document that was to be internally circulated. It was not to be made public. It was secret matter, and uh, it concerns um, particularly the kind of executions that were carried out uh, by this uh, Einsatzkommando uh, number three. Um, it begins uh, in 1941, and what's interesting, this is the, these are the dates here. Um, in German, you might know that the day is written first and then you have the month, and so this is 1941, the date here, uh, the year, and it goes systematically uh, through the different days. So starting January, February, March, April, May, June, July. July 1941, this would be the 19th of July 1941. This is the name of the town here. Um, Juden is Jew and uh, male Jew. Uh, this is a, a female, uh, a woman Jew. Uh, Lithuanians, sometimes uh, Russians or communists. And it basically tallies the number of people that were killed day by day by this Einsatzkommando group. Um, it's a pretty extraordinary thing because it basically is an ongoing tally of the effort of this particular mobile, command, mobile commando unit as it moved through um, various towns in Lithuania. Um, and what they do is they go day by day, and so at the end of this month, basically, 
3,834 3, people uh, had been had been killed. So I'll go back to the go back to the English version here. Um, so this is this is the page that we were just looking at in German. Um, as you go through this, you can kind of get a sense about what was going on. They reported uh, here. This is the name of the town. 254 Jews, 42 Jewishes, one Polish communist, a Lithuanian, uh, and so forth. Uh, the, ma the mayor as well. Um, goes on listing the number day by day. Now, if you go to the end, and this is uh, pretty extraordinary, you just keep going down. By the end, they've killed 137,000 people. Um, it's, it's pretty staggering, given that this all happened within the set of a few months. And so here we are, November 25th, 1941. They're in the city of Vilna. And uh, one of the uh, important things about Vilna is that this is a major Jewish cultural capital. Uh, we'll actually talk about Vilna next week. And uh, you'll also notice that it took a number of days, uh, whereas some towns were actually quite small and the population was killed. Uh, very rapidly. Um, in the case of Vilna, it actually took um, more than a week uh, to eradicate a very large portion of the population. So amazingly, uh, they also list children. I mean, so you have 382 Jews, 789 Jewishes, 362 Jewish children. Um, it's almost, a, a, it's, it's so systematic and it's so cold. I mean, it's simultaneously an amazingly objective, cold document of a task that was carried out. Um, there's really, there's nothing emotional or human about it whatsoever. It's, I think, tremendously calculating and really lacking, I think, all aspects of human empathy uh, or a sense that you're actually talking about human beings here. You might as well be talking about, you know, you're, you're getting rid of, um, you know, locusts. Uh, it simply, and that's in the perception of the people who were carrying out, that's exactly what they were doing. Um, but what's so extraordinary here is just the kind of amazing, cold, calculating, objective reporting of what had happened. And so the conclusion that, uh, that he reaches um, is to, says, today I can confirm that our objective to solve the Jewish problem for Lithuania has been achieved by Einsatz Commando 3. In Lithuania, there are no more Jews, um, apart from the Jewish workers and their families. And by Jewish workers and their families, they mean particularly Jews employed in slave labor camps, uh, most of whom will also be, be killed. So if they killed at this point 137,000, if you might remember, to, just to go back to the, to the map that we had had earlier. Oops, turn that off. So remember what we're talking about. There's 150,000 in 1939. Um, by 1941, 137,000 had been killed, and the remaining group probably employed as slave laborers. Um, Estonia and Latvia uh, are also declared shortly thereafter to be Juden Rhein, uh, which is free, free of Jews. So you might notice as well a couple other things that come up in the Vansay Conference uh, film that you, that you watched. Um, a couple other issues that were also sort of in discussion at this period, one of which is the question of sterilization. Um, this practice was already being widely adopted, um, particularly within Germany in the uh, late 1930s, actually starting in 1936, um, largely in order to sterilize groups of people within Germany that were considered to be uh, unhealthy or degenerate or unable to support um, the German uh, world view about the superiority of their race. Um, people that were sterilized uh, were people of African descent, uh, sometimes called in German uh, uh, people of the Rhineland who tended to be um, from northern Africa. Uh, you had sterilization, um, you had sterilization of Jews, you also had sterilization of people who were uh, mentally, uh, who were mentally handicapped and or who had various kind of physical uh, disabilities. Uh, the idea being that they should not be able to reproduce. Sterilization processes were introduced more widely uh, with regard to a question of Jews of mixed races. And this is actually something that uh, was handled in a lot of detail at the end of the film because this is something that was actively debated um, about what to do with those Jews who are of mixed blood. 
Uh, and the issue here, again, is that mixed blood shouldn't be allowed to reproduce because that blood will continue to be bad, so to speak, or contaminated uh, down the line. So it's an issue that already comes up in this, in this report as well, since this was an active policy uh, of the Nazi, of the, of the, of the, active policy of the Nazis. Um, the other thing that comes up that I um, wanted, wanted to mention is, uh, yeah. it actually goes back to the German. And I wanted to see if, um, just briefly, if I could show you the German on, on this. I think that it's, it's often worth uh, just seeing the terms that were, that's great. Um, oops, I don't know if it'll come back up here. Where did it go? Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, seems like our internet connection has somehow failed us. Huh, interesting. Yeah. Well, in any case, um, in any case, you can look at the, the German for yourself, and uh, hopefully, our <laughs> we've always been cursed in this classroom with the internet connection. Um, it's maybe gone, and, but hopefully it'll return. But in any case, uh, what you can do is we can look at the Jaeger report in German. And what I think is important to recognize is that many of the conceptual terms that were used in the Wannsee conference, so the idea of cleansing, Zaubern, the idea of uh, places that are Jewish, are free of Jews, Judenfrei or Judenrein, uh, the use of the term evacuation, all of these terms were used uh, by this particular commander who was in charge of his particular group of mobile uh, killer mobile killing commando, which illustrates something to me, which is the pervasiveness of a policy and the kind of complicity of this, uh, of why groups of people in carrying it out even prior to the Wannsee conference. Um, it tells us something about, uh, in some ways, the breadth and the kind of, the, the, the amount of buy-in that was necessary in order for Nazi genocidal policies to actually, um, to actually happen. All righty, um, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and switch then to the uh, Vance conference itself. And uh, this may be a challenge if we, oh, OK, good. We are connected once again to the internet. Good. Um, and one of the things I provided you with uh, on the, the links for today are some links to the actual uh, house itself in Berlin and a little bit of information about who the people were that took place, uh, that, that attended the conference. Although January 20th, 1942, which is the day the conference took place, is often considered a kind of emblematic date for the final uh, decision to carry out uh, the genocide against the Jews, the, the kind of the actual authorization of the Gesamtlosung, it's important to recognize, and this is something that I was trying to point out already, is that this process was already well underway. Um, you already had more than a million people killed by these mobile killing units. You already had the introduction of carbon monoxide gassing uh, in three of the major death camps. You already had uh, a massive exterminating, an exterminatory process underway. And in many ways, the conference itself was largely, was largely a symbolic, um, almost uh, administrative uh, function. That is to say, it wasn't actually where policies were debated. They weren't, they weren't assembled in order to actually figure out what to do. They largely were assembled in order to say, this is what we're doing, and it would be helpful if we could have a little bit more buy-in from these various groups that would be necessary to streamline and expedite the process. So this was not really a matter, as you saw in the film, there was not a lot of debating going on. They weren't uh, really questioning whether, uh, whether this was going to happen. It was happening. Uh, it was really a question about how it would happen more efficiently and whether different units that hadn't been completely involved in terms of actually carrying it out could be involved. Um, and this is where Eichmann actually begins to play a significantly larger role uh, than he had ever played up until this point. Um, the house itself um, is actually um, quite nice, uh, as you saw in the film. Um, it exists in Berlin today. Um, if you go to Google Earth, um, and I'll provide you some links to this actually at the end of class today, or at least on our web links, you can see the house. It exists today. You can visit it. It's just outside of Berlin. It's located on a lake. 
Um, it's a beautiful villa that was built in the turn of the century. Um, it had gone through a number of owners, um, but it was mainly the house of a very uh, important uh, German um, industrialist. He had sold the house and it had gone through a number of uh, other, um, a couple, it turned over a couple of times before it became uh, part of the property of the SS in the, in the mid to late 1930s. And it was used mainly, um, this was the, probably the, the, its main major use was for this conference that took place um, in January 20th, 1942. Um, the participants, um, the 15 men who were assembled, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, I thought I had a, let me get a better, slightly better picture of them. Um, Yeah, put them all as a group. Um, so these are these are the men. Um, all of these men were played obviously by actors in, in the film. And uh, what's interesting is that these are not again the highest ranked Nazi officials. Uh, the highest ranked person that was there was of course uh, Heydrich himself. Um, now the name of the person we know the best may have been Eichmann, but at the time Eichmann was actually the lowest ranked official who was assembled at this conference. Um, he in fact had virtually no power and really very little standing within the bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic organization of the SS. Now that changed dramatically in the course of the years that followed and in fact he became responsible um, as you saw in the film but also as we know historically he became responsible essentially for uh, deportations, organizations of trains and train scheduling and he became a, a kind of the bureaucratic administrator of the, of the expediency and of the material means of moving the Jews um, to their extermination and their death camps and the death camps. He was, um, he survived the war as you probably know. He went into hiding in Argentina. He was captured in 1961 by Israeli uh, agents. He was brought to stand trial. Uh, he was found guilty for crimes against humanity um, and crimes against the Jewish people and wa was hung. Um, but before being hung, he also offered extraordinary amount of testimony, some of which you can find on YouTube. Basically, it's, unfortunately, most of it's in German. If you don't read German or understand German, it'll be hard to hear. And he also speaks with a very a particular German dialect. Um, but he offered a tremendous amount of testimony, including testimony about his role at the Vansay Conference, the notes that he took, and the, the protocols that we have today which are um, surviving from his, from his hand. Um, this is interesting too, is that each of the men that were assembled at the Vansay conference received a copy uh, of the conference protocols, basically of the things that were discussed uh, at the meeting. They were asked to burn those, to destroy them. Um, only one person actually saved them and they were found after the war. And it's from those that we uh, have today, the, um, what's essentially the original of the, of the protocols that Eichmann had, had written. A couple other things about these men that I think is relevant. Um, these men were, for the most part, highly educated. Um, Eichmann probably being the exception. Uh, Eichmann didn't complete high school. Um, he had uh, been on a, on a track to study engineering. He never, never completed it. But most of these, as you can see by their names, were doctors. Uh, they were either doctors of law or they had PhDs in various fields. In fact, no fewer than eight uh, were highly educated, uh, having completed advanced degrees at universities in Germany. Um, and what's extraordinary about that is I think it already helps us to um, displace a very traditional stereotype that we have about Nazis. Uh, there are a bunch of uneducated racist thugs who had no idea, you know, to be, and so forth. If they were just educated, then they could become, you know, civil, they would become good people. And it's kind of this bespeaks something else. In fact, they were highly educated and their education didn't actually stop them from carrying out a genocide. And this I think is a very fundamental paradox about education and culture. Uh, we like to think of them as separate things, that if you become educated and cultured and aware of the world, uh, that somehow you become a more compassionate person. Uh, and I don't think that these things follow. And uh, this, is, um, this is certainly borne out by the very fact that many of these people were highly educated and actually used their education to foster uh, and to carry out um, a genocide. So it, it raises a question. It doesn't necessarily mean that education is irrelevant. I'm not saying that. 
but it does point out the fact that education isn't a necessary means to stop uh, racism. That is to say, you could actually use it uh, to carry out something um, like this. In any case, um, so these men uh, represent different who, who came together in Berlin, came primarily from a number of different sectors. And I would argue that this was kind of like a hodgepodge. Uh, this was not, in many ways, the most systematic grouping of people. Uh, a number of them represented um, folks who had worked in the Eastern territories, either directly um, in places like Riga and Latvia and Lithuania, which were essentially where the German line was at the time uh, as it moved further and further uh, into uh, Soviet uh, territory, uh, who had been working, so to speak, on the ground, uh, but also people from various ministries, uh, the Ministry of Justice, uh, people who were involved in uh, legalities uh, of German law, particularly Stuttgart. Um, and you also had a number of other ministries represented, particularly ones that may strike us as kind of strange, but uh, our ministry of race and resettlement um, and, and other essentially high-ranking Nazi functionaries um, whose role it was here was not really to resist or to um, really break ranks, but instead it was simply, they were simply brought together in order to streamline a process uh, which had already been uh, decided upon. So, um, so in any case, you can read more about these individual people if you're interested. Um, I'll talk more about Eichmann on Thursday because I think his case is, because we, we know so much about him and because of his testimonies and because of the, role, the, the, the very critical role that he played, uh, particularly with regard to the um, deportation of the Hungarian Jews in 1944, um, he's someone that will demand uh, more attention. The other men, I'm, I'm, other than and Heydrich, uh, won't be talking really about, and uh, largely their role, with the exception maybe of Stuttgart, um, have in, has in some ways uh, faded uh, a bit. Stuttgart is known because of uh, his role in articulating the Nuremberg Laws, and because, uh, as you perhaps saw in the film, a kind of uh, a sense about the legality of what was going on was, was still debated. And uh, this always strikes me as so interesting because there's essentially a question about Nazi law, worldview, and Nazi legality, and then something else which may be, say, general human rights law, or a law which uh, defies or goes beyond the specificities uh, of the law that a nation uh, puts together. And this, of course, becomes the very distinguishing these two things, becomes the basis of uh, putting together conventions to fight genocide, and in fact, the idea that there are universal laws, not just laws of a particular country. Um, the laws of a particular country are the ones that these men tried to articulate and also tried to justify what they were doing based on their own kind of world view. All right. Um, see this. So I'm going to look briefly before we turn to the film now of the actual Vansay protocol itself, which I gave you a link in the syllabus to the protocol in English. And it's something that I, that I hope you had a chance to read through. Um, because this is um, a very significant primary document that, should, uh, that we need to engage with in order, again, to understand from the perspective of the perpetrators what they said they were doing, how they articulated it, and what the stakes of the debate were um, in 1942. So, um, so what you have here is uh, these are the minutes of the discussion. I said again the minutes were taken by, by Eichmann. Uh, these are the men who were present at the discussion. And um, a couple of things that I want to just draw your attention to, starting here. Um, the chief of the security police um, and the SD then gave a short report. This is basically just what happened. A report of the struggle which has been carried out thus far against uh, this enemy, uh, meaning, of course, the Jews. The essential points being the following. A, the expulsion of the Jews from every sphere of life of the German people and the expulsion of the Jews from the living space of the German people. Um, here they're using a couple of interesting words. Um, the word in German here is uh, Drängung, meaning the, the actually the pushing back, the expelling, uh, the kind of uh, repressing and getting rid of. Um, and the living space here is that word Lebensraum, which Hitler had articulated. Uh, the idea that the Germans needed a pure living space, 
And this pure living space uh, is something that became more and more contested as Germany uh, acquired through war more and more land and hence more and more Jews. Um, so this becomes kind of the, the rationale, this, uh, this question of expulsion. Um, so what's needed to happen, so the tasks before them as they articulated them, to make all the necessary arrangements for the preparation for an increased immigration of the Jews, um, to direct the flow of immigration, to speed the procedure of immigration in each individual case. Now, this word, uh, immigration, I mean, usually when we talk about immigration, uh, meaning travel out of, in this case, we're talking about voluntary travel, right? Someone who decides to leave a place on their own. You decide to go to a different country. Um, in this case, we're not talking about voluntarily leaving. We're talking about forced uh, exile, or essentially, this is the word they're using to talk about deportation. Um, now, how these are articulated here, often very euphemistically, but these terms, because they're deployed so widely and because they're deployed in so many different circumstances, and there's already this historical reality of what's happening, we know that these terms are not just euphemisms, right? We know that these terms are actually motivating uh, action. So, a little bit further down, and this uh, comes also in the, in the discussion of the film, there was, uh, as far as we know, that the participants were provided with maps um, uh, from which, uh, at the conference itself, that Heydrich spoke from. These maps basically articulated country by country the number of Jews that live there. Um, at, and this is, in, again, this is in 1942. A couple of things are worth uh, looking at. This is the situation already um, in Lithuania. Remember, this is where Jaeger was uh, with his mobile command uh, killing unit. There were 150,000 Jews prior. They're now 34,000 as of 1942. This is confirmed in multiple places. It's confirmed by his report. It's confirmed by the Vansai Conference. And so what you have is you have already a number of different units of the Nazis speaking to one another about the progress of their, of their genocidal policy. Um, Estonia, already free of Jews. Uh, Latvia, only 3,500 left. So this is already, talk, we're already talking about a policy that's in place, already talking about actions that are happening. Um, a little further down, um, you can see all the, the numbers that we're talking about here. Um, 742,000 in Hungary. Uh, you might remember that this, in fact, is a number that's true up until the summer of 1944. Uh, and uh, remember, this is the time, Hungary was one of the very last countries um, where a significant body of Jews uh, were killed towards the end of the war. Uh, this is where Elie Wiesel uh, was from. So at this point in the war in 1942, um, Hungary hadn't been quote unquote cleansed. Um, if you look at Germany, um, let's see, a couple of things. Austria, um, Germany proper, 131,000. Uh, so this is already down, uh, down about 60% uh, from, from 1939. Mm -hmm. um, the largest number here estimated to be in the USSR. And of course, this also gives them a significant amount of pause as to whether this is a, is a, is a feasible plan. Um, so they estimate 11,000 Jews. Um, this is an extraordinary document because basically what they're laying out is very, in a very kind of calculated way, this is the, this is the situation. This is what we estimate. Um, we're going to carry it out. Um, and uh, it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take a lot of uh, buy-in. It's going to take a lot of support. But this is a pretty clearly articulated agenda with a certain reality check. And the reality check is just the sheer number. Um, so I'll read you a, a small um, little portion here, which I want to, um, yeah, this part here. This is actually, a large part of this is actually quoted directly in the film. And this is interesting to us because I mentioned the film is obviously played by actors and uh, actresses. And the film is clearly a reenactment of something that happened, a historical event. Uh, but the words that are articulated by Heydrich and others actually derive from the, actual, the protocols, the archival protocols of the Vansay Conference. So under proper guidance in the course of the final solution, the Jews are to be allocated for appropriate labor in the East. 
Um, basically, this is the selection process of able working Jews and those who will be killed. Able-bodied Jews separated according to sex will be taken in large work columns to these areas for work on roads, in the course of which action, doubtless a large portion will be eliminated by natural causes. The possible final remnant will, since it will be a, undoubtedly consist of the most resistant portion, have to be treated accordingly because it is in the product of natural selection and would, if released, act as a seed of a new Jewish revival. Uh, see the experience of history. Um, in the course of the practical execution of the final solution, Europe will be combed, and this is directly quoted by, uh, by, by, he by he uh, Heydrich in the film, will be combed through from west to east. Uh, Germany proper, including the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, will have to be handled first due to the housing problem and additional social and political necessities. The evacuated Jews will be first sent group by group to the so-called transit ghettos from which they'll be transported to the east. Um, so in a sense, this one sentence, this sentence which is so almost alarmingly simple, uh, in some ways encapsulates the entire process. Uh, this is basically what happened. You have Jews being sent to, to ghettos, being transported to transit ghettos, uh, temporary places, and then eventually sent to either to concentration or death camps. Um, and to the east here, again, an amazingly um, significant euphemism, but clearly articulating what's happening. A process of combing through, a process of cleansing, resettlement, selection for slave labor, and basically um, annihilation. Finally in this, they talk about uh, the setting up of Theresienstadt, which is uh, a so-called model uh, concentration camp in some ways for, uh, for older uh, Jews. It's something of a, something of a show, uh, largely um, for, the, for the public. And they also talk extensively in this report, and I'm not gonna go into all this right now, the debate about people of mixed blood. Uh, and so this, this question of mixed blood was one of the most vexing questions for the Vansay conference participants. And interestingly, there's a, a question which to us seems so bureaucratic and almost like a technicality. It's something that bothered them tremendously because mixed blood basically meant you're neither completely German nor completely Jewish. And it raised this kind of paradoxical question. I mean, in a worldview that's so absolute, right? If the Nazis are all this, they were all Aryan, superior, and so forth. The Jews are all this. They're all vermin and, and diseased and so forth. People of mixed blood kind of uh, were confounded that distinction uh, precisely because they weren't either. They were both. And so coming up with policies that actually dealt with this question of intermarriage and mixed blood was a fundamental problem in some ways for the participants in the Vance Conference. All righty. So this is, uh, as you'll see, you, you know a little bit about some of these debates that, that, that transpired. Let's go ahead and turn to the film um, because I want to, um, hopefully we're connected, looks like we are. Um, I want to show you a couple of scenes and give you a little bit of, at least we have spent about 25 minutes or so so we can discuss uh, the film. The film fits uh, within a category uh, of films that I would call um, historical reenactment. And um, that is to say, it's meant to take a historical event based on whatever sources we have available to us. These sources may be archival documents, their um, places that we know were occupied, with certain behaviors, things that people said, um, testimonies and other things, and as much as possible create an environment uh, which is meant to reenact that historical event. Um, the conference itself, um, we know when it happened, we know where it happened, we know long, how long it happened. We know the participants came together. They had a discussion which lasted about 80 minutes in length. It wasn't terribly long. There were things that were discussed and debated, but nothing really seriously uh, was debated because they already knew what they were gonna do. It was largely to get the buy-in and support of the various ministries and various uh, groups that they thought, uh, various leaders who they thought would be necessary for streamlining the plan. Um, Heydrich uh, here, um, who's the protagonist in this film, obviously, articulates, most of the words he articulates in, around the table are based on the protocols that we have from Eichmann. So we don't know if it was exactly these words, but this is as close as we know. And so in terms of historical reenactment, this is, it never is absolute. At no point can we actually confirm that these are the actual words said when they were said but it's the closest we can come based on the testimonies and the archival evidence that we, that we have, which is where the film, the film draws on. So I'm gonna let you play a small portion here of this. 
Oops. Let's see if I can. See if I can turn. Oops. That's on my computer, but not yours. Let's see. Ah. Let's plug that in better. Let's see if that will work. No. Let's see. We intend to be complete. We will turn your up from west to east, starting with Protectors, Bohemia, and Moravia. So I'm going to actually start that over. But this is the part that I was mentioning just before from the Bonsai Conference. And most of the casualties eliminated by natural causes. We intend to be complete. We will turn your up from west to east, starting with Protectors, Bohemia, and Moravia. We will evacuate them first. All to be evacuated Jews, group by group, will be sent to, call them transit ghettos, and then transported to the east. Sir, please. You want yours first, I understand. Let me make my case. You will be heard. When in your plan do you take their women away? And they love to make the beast. <laughs> Control yourself. Jews who have beyond 65 years will be moved into old age ghettos, possibly Croatian staff will be chosen where they can expire at their own speed. We will sweep all severely wounded Jewish veterans and those given the highest military decorations from the Iron Cross first class. At that time, distinction will be abandoned. They go too into the old age ghettos. Or we will be drowning in requests for exemptions and interventions. I was referring to intervention of another kind. But there's a waste. Oh, this is already begun. But when you include privileges for these Jews or those Jews, the party council will see this interest a certain way. And Martin Bolton. So I'm going to stop right there. But what you have here is, of course, the articulated points of view that when, when Heydrich is articulating something that uh, he's basically, we're drawing off of the, or the film is drawing off of the archival evidence. And then the debates that happen between the various other um, members who are associated there are debates that uh, largely uh, periphery uh, to the actual carrying out of the plan. So we know of uh, particular points of view that various uh, ministers had espoused, various questions that were asked, particularly concerning legality and, uh, and really issues that were almost self-serving for their own particular domain. That is, whether they would have enough workers or whether the, they had enough uh, military or enough financial support and things like that. So these, these kind of questions then come up in the film at various points. But the first question, I guess, we might want to begin with, just trying to understand a little bit about the portrayal of the perpetrators, is just, in fact, that is just the portrayal. That is to say, what kind of people are they? I mean, how, how do we even begin to articulate um, these characters? Like, how would, we describe, uh, how would we describe them? Can we differentiate among them? Are they all the same? Uh, or are they, in fact, in some ways, different uh, individuals? Or are they perhaps different variations of the same? I mean, as you watch the film and you kind of saw this uh, unwind, um, how would you begin to just characterize, I mean, these, these Nazis? I mean, what kind of people are they? What would you say? Let's put a couple of notes here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the question we're dealing with, is this one. What kind of people are they? Is there something redeemable about them? I mean, who are they? Yeah, I think that's largely right. I mean, bureaucrats, functionaries, calculating, um, self-serving. Sure. What else? I found um, Kritzinger in particular to be very intriguing because there was, like she was saying, it seemed it seemed sort of like he was bothered by the fact that like <coughs> authority was being challenged and that like mm. and that um, Heidrich was taking control when he felt like maybe Hitler should be in charge of this. Right. But Right, right. And this is interesting to us, I mean, for a couple of things. I mean, that's probably the one character in the film that perhaps brooks some resistance. I mean, he stands up at one point, he's looking down, he's variously, he's unclear if he's actually at the table or he's away from, right? This is the one person, I think, at least in the film, that uh, begins to have some questions. I mean, Stuttgart maybe has questions, but I think you're right. They're largely questions about legality. Uh, and they're largely questions about whether um, the questions that are being put into place about interracial marriage and mixed-blooded Jews would still apply with regard to the Nuremberg Laws. And, but I think with regard to um, Kritzinger, it's exactly this question, I think, at least in the film, as maybe 
having some question about uh, wondering if this is, uh, yeah, wondering if it's right. Um, now, this is interesting as well because one of the things that happens, we'll look at some footage from the Nuremberg trials um, in, a, in a couple of weeks. Um, and one of the things that happens so, so often in these trials is the fact that the people who are there have no shame whatsoever and in fact consistently uh, declare what they were doing as either following orders or as doing something that served a greater good. Uh, so to have that depicted in the film as this kind of moment of, of perhaps a kind of moment of empathy is, I'm not sure if it's either a wish on our part, so to speak, a wish by the people who created the film in order to project this into a particular character, or if it actually did reflect um, his particular historical character. It's an open, it's I think it's a question that's, that, that actually probably is worth investigation and, and maybe some debate. Other thoughts about uh, the other, the protagonists? I mean, is there anything redeemable about um, any of them besides perhaps uh, Kritzinger? Is there anything redeemable out there about, say, the other ordinary Nazis? Thoughts? Yeah. I mean, that made me think that, I mean, one of the things that I think is so astounding here is that we're also, as much as they're functionaries and calculating and maybe have, uh, have kind of have these sort of like bureaucratic, almost like cogs in the machine, they're also fundamentally human beings. I mean, these are fundamentally human decisions that are being made. And I think the one that you mentioned is that they have hopes and desires after the war. He hopes he can move into the house. They hope that the Nazis, you know, become the ones who, the victors who write the history books, right? It's always the victors who write the history books. Um, they eat, they sleep, they partake in drinks, they joke, they play. Um, they have very human qualities uh, because they're human beings. Right. Right. I mean, he quotes Goethe at one time in the film, who's a kind of German Shakespeare, a great poet. Uh, he talks about music. Um, it's almost, and this is again, that goes back to that very paradox about education and culture that I mentioned before. These men had PhDs, right? These men were very well educated. They were very well read. They understood German philosophy. They understood German music. They enjoyed opera. They read poetry. Um, they, were, they were cultured people. Uh, they were civilized uh, in terms of what we understand uh, to be civilization. And not only that, they also had the same exact qualities as us. That is, the everyday qualities. They ate, they slept, they had jokes. You know, they, 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 they were almost uh, like a bunch of, almost like old boys network in some ways. Um, they had a kind of fraternity about them. And yet what they were talking about is so seemingly inhuman, is so seemingly so far divorced from the things that most of us talk about with our friends. And so it's like how to reconcile those two things. Uh, the, th the thing is they coexisted. Uh, they coexisted in the same person. And you'll see this when you look at Carl Hawker's photo book about what he did. They'll go out at nighttime with women, playing in bands, playing music, um, eating strawberries, uh, and during the day they'll execute thousands of people. These things coexisted. Uh, they weren't even completely antithetical. And so it's like, what's the significance of that? What's the significance that you can be entirely human, cultured, civilized, educated, um, and simultaneously carry out things that we consider to be utterly violent and barbaric? So a kind of fundamental paradox. I mean, at the, kind of the heart of what we think about in terms of our humanity. And we have a lot of different capabilities, right? We're capable of love and empathy and kindness and tremendous charity. And we're also capable of tremendous violence. And that's almost what's fundamentally human. These, these very different capabilities or potentialities. So what about us as viewers, as we watch, uh, as we watch this film? I mean, often within film theory, and I think with the case of, say, Maybe you've seen Schindler's List before. We'll watch Schindler's List in the class. Um, we identify uh, as viewers or spectators with certain characters. I mean, we have a kind of a process in which as we watch the film, we identify with a hero. We identify with um, someone who does something, in this case, with Schindler obviously redeeming. 
I mean, the question of identification in this film is actually a really interesting question because if anything, um, it's really this kind of massive disidentification that happens, right? I mean, we can't say that we identify with the perspective of Heydrich, and we certainly don't identify, I don't think, with um, the other characters uh, in, around the table. Um, so it raises a question about us as viewers, what our role is in watching a film like that. I mean, what is, you know, if we're watching a historical reenactment, you're basically watching a history event unfold. You're being privy to something that you weren't obviously at. And so what does it mean for us? I mean, who, what kind of viewers are we? Are we, are we voyeurs? Are we meant to be um, estranged from what we're seeing rather than uh, connected to it? I mean, what becomes or how would you understand our role as a viewer watching this film? I mean, an easier way to put it is, how did you feel? Like, what kind of emotional effect did you have? I mean, if any, were you just kind of like, what is this? <laughs> like, I have no relation to it. Were you angered? Were you, uh, were you uh, annoyed? Uh, were you just not cared? I mean, what kind of emotional effect did the film have, or did it elicit? And the reason I'm asking this question is because I think that the film was very much constructed to have a particular effect. Um, what do you think? I think you identify with the characters who are <coughs> kind of opposed to mass deportation and killing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, it seems like the only one you could possibly identify goes back to this question of Kitzinger, right? And his statement at the end of the film where he was ashamed of what he saw. It's like at that moment, maybe we see something slightly redeemable in this whole mass, knowing everything that happened. Uh, there's this tiny moment where the film gives you almost, it almost gives you something. It's like, well, thank God, at least he felt ashamed. Um, but other than that, it kind of hits you over the head of these people have no feelings. There's almost incapable of empathy uh, and an amazing kind of disidentification that I think uh, the film is meant to elicit. I mean, if you think about it in comparison to other films where you have a hero, you have someone that you identify with, there's, someone, there's a good person, there's something redeeming. And I think Schindler, which again, we haven't watched in the class, but maybe you've heard about it. I mean, the story of Schindler is he did actively save Jews and he was a card-carrying Nazi. And so there's something fundamentally redeeming about him. And we as viewers, as we watch a film like that, also have a certain space uh, in which we inhabit. And it's a space, I think, of a certain amount of safety. And it's a space in which uh, we, I think, yeah, it's a space of identification. And in many ways, this film closes that off. It doesn't really give us room. Um, and instead, perhaps makes us voyeurs on something that we weren't privy to, meaning we're seeing an event unfold that we weren't actually, actually at. Let me skip towards another, a couple other, there's two other clips I'll show you before we uh, end today. So here they are. This is the map part. I'm going to actually scoop to another spot uh, here. So I want to say one thing about no. the question of Sorry. legality here. No. The sterilization is promising, but uh, attempting a dispossession of what are, are clearly defined laws in order to impose all these restrictive evaluations is quite difficult. But forgive me, it is like the imposing of ad hoc law. Depending on subjective evaluations as to whether he looks Jewish or he has a Jewish personality or whatever else, that, is subject to personal interpretation and variation, including the, the assertions of the damn Jew himself. 
And what does it do? It subverts the Nuremberg laws and it perpetuates disrespect for the law. I think we are absolutely taking our proposal carefully. Now, with all due respect, Lord Franklin, it's a tangle. And this is not pride of authorship. I am simply reacting to the bureaucratic train wreck that's upon us. So a couple of things I want to say here. I mean, this issue here, I mean, debating the legality of Nazi law by Nazis. I mean, it's a really interesting moment in the film because here you have this question, I think from our point of view, we have a perspective of Nazi law is not law of the land. Uh, we have the perspective of the, um, the UN, the perspective of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Conventions Against Genocide. You might remember from Samantha Power's book when uh, in 1948, the UN had ratified um, the Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. They very specifically say that there are laws that are in place that go beyond national laws. And so article number nine, which I'm gonna read for you just briefly, it says, um, uh, disputes between the contracting parties relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of the state for genocide, shall be submitted to an international court of justice at the request of any parties in dispute. An international court of justice, this is something that was invented precisely because of this problem. This is a Nazi laws or the laws of a state cannot be universalized because those laws are by definition the very particular racist laws of that state. Right? So the idea of coming up with something like uh, the Convention for the Prevention of Genocide is the recognition of something international and something universal. And those things would go beyond uh, the laws, the idiosyncratic, so to speak, laws of the land that enabled uh, something like this. So last part that I want to show you today, which is uh, over here. And this is yeah. And this is the part I wanted to show you in the film, which I think is is actually it's quite interesting even to watch the camera as the camera moves around the table here. Um, one of the things that uh, the film does is again positions us as viewers on something that we were obviously not at, right? A historical event which has been reenacted before our eyes. And as the camera moves from person to person. It basically allows us to have the view around the table of what uh, Heydrich had articulated to be the unanimity that he was aspiring for, right? The unanimity, which meant just the participation of all those people who were gathered around. And so watch as the camera kind of unfolds and moves from person to person as they articulate their agreement. I trust my enthusiasm is clear. Yes. Lorna? I would like to know that adequate supplies of labor will still be available, especially I would like to urge that speech that Dr. Meyer asked me, but also I'm not a discipline of population as we Germans. And I will report to Willoughby Group for the Governor General. He will understand that I'm relieving him of a burden, Colonel. I thoroughly approve of an anxious start. I look forward to working with your office and yours, Colonel. This will be the better. So in there, uh, this is, uh, let's sorry, my last point here. You have Eichmann getting up at that point. You have notes. You have the idea that this is basically a, a historical event that happened in secret. That is to say, it's to be something that happens, will be orchestrated, will be carried out, and yet it's something that never happened. And so this extraordinary moment of what the film is also doing is it's also demystifying something that intentionally by the people who called the event was to be something done in secret. All right, uh, that's, we'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>